Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to a new episode of our webinar series. Today, we're going to be covering India, a blueprint to successfully launching and operating cross border e commerce. In other words, if you have a successful e com business and you want to optimize payments experience, this is what you need to know. I'm Michelle. I lead growth for the local. I'm based out of San Francisco. And today, I have the pleasure of having the one and only Rodrigo also presenting with me. Rodri leads our product organization. He's based out of HQ in Montevideo, Uruguay. Hi, Rodri. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Mitch, for your wonderful presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm Rodrigo. I lead product the local. And together with Mitch, we're going to tackle uh, many interesting insights for India and for uh, cross border e commerce. Thank you. A few housekeeping items uh, before kicking off the session. We're going to be covering questions at the very end of the presentation. If you go to the go to webinar control panel, you can post your questions during the session. So we'll make sure to cover those at the end. And also we'll be sharing a recording of the presentation after the webinar. So a quick overview on the agenda. We'll start with a overview of the payments landscape in India. We'll review all the locally relevant payment methods in the market. We'll briefly touch on taxes and we'll end with our payout solution. So let's start with the payments landscape in India. India, as probably most of you know, is the second largest economy in the world after China also the second largest in terms of population, also after China. It's still uh, very early days for cross-border transactions, cross-border e-commerce in India. There's a lot to grow. We'll cover on the e-commerce payment mix, but just for you to get an idea, it's pretty uh, splitted between international credit cards, domestic cards, wallets, uh, bank transfers, and cash on delivery. We'll also talk about UPI and how it became a game changer over the last three years. And also relevant aspects on the e-commerce and mobile commerce in India. So a few uh, payment tr trends to watch. Uh, let's start with bank transfers. Uh, the government initiative with demonetization a few years back basically uh, enabled for most of the Indians to get access to financial instruments. Uh, mobile e-commerce keeps growing. More than half of the market uh, actually buys, more than half of internet users, sorry, buys from mobile devices. Uh, and 65% of the population is under the age of 35, basically resulting in a population that can easily adapt to new technology and can easily become a digital uh, society. From uh, the wallets and cash on delivery standpoint, uh, merchants are discouraging consumers from using cash on delivery. It used to be huge, now it's declining. And also we'll cover e-wallets uh, with Paytm being uh, the, the main leader. And also we'll also uh, talk about some other players in the, in the wallet spectrum. Let's talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in the market. If you look at all the indicators on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see uh, that they all seem very favorable uh, with uh, B2C e-commerce growth, with a lot of people starting to uh, buy from international sellers, with uh, tier two and tier three businesses becoming more relevant, and also the lending business becoming more and more uh, predominant. On the challenges side, uh, cash on delivery also brings a lot of constraints for e uh, cross-border e-commerce. Debit cards, which uh, are huge in India, are not usually enabled for international usage. So users need to call their banks to activate that. Credit card penetration is very, very low at a 3%. And also, uh, there's, a, there's a consumer perception issue where most of people think that debit cards are only for withdrawing money from ATMs and net banking for online commerce, creating some friction in the payments flow. The internet penetration, uh, although it's growing, 
it's still very low at 40 percent and the regulatory framework it's still uh very difficult to understand and to comply with uh creating some friction obviously in the in the cross-border sector let's look at the locally relevant payment methods starting with net banking uh, which is a platform that enables uh, interbank transactions in real time uh, also credit and debit cards with all the international brands uh, present in the market visa mastercard amex diners and also local brands local brands like rupee uh, on the e-wallet side and mobile payments uh, Paytm is the main leader with uh, PhonePay and Google Pay also very predominant. And finally, the star UPI. Uh, we'll talk about, about UPI later, later. But basically, the National Payment Corporation of India created launched UPI three years ago. Um, with today, over 40% of all the internet transactions uh, being routed through UPI, this unified payments interface and over 800 million transactions a month. We'll discuss some of the behaviors uh, for each of these payment methods families. Rodri, back to you uh, for the payment flows. Thanks, uh, Mitch. Um, so um, just talking a bit about net banking. So it's uh, an instant real-time payment uh, where uh, the user uh, basically pays with their uh, bank accounts. More than 95% of the um, users can uh, go through the net banking uh, flow and it gives a um, sense of easiness to the user because all the uh, payment details are already pre-filled for the user when they enter their home banking. So this is something that uh, kind of, uh, if you want, differs between a little bit from uh, what we have for UPI where basically um, for UPI we have the still an immediate uh, payment solution but here it goes to the system of um, using a one virtual private address this can be we'll show later but this can be where it's a bank a wallet or any financial institution where the user has uh, this virtual address that can be funded through different um, accounts, whether it's a bank account, a card, um, or um, a wallet. And it helps the users not only to pay uh, through for e-commerce, but also it's a key player in the demonetization through P2P payments, uh, helping all the user base to send money um, from and to uh, Indian users. As Michelle was saying, more than 100 million uh, transactions in July 2019 without 20 billion uh, TPV in the same uh, the same month. Rodri, adding on top of that and to also uh, showcase the relevance of UPI, they already overtook uh, debit card transactions by both volume and value, according to RB RBI. So it's huge, it's massive. Correct, correct. And, and we are seeing a shift from uh, banks, from wallets, starting to encourage their users to go through uh, the UPI, uh, the UPI system that uh, is giving uh, this flexibility and this easiness to the entire users and also the financial institutions. So it's a, as you said, it's a huge player and it's really relevant today for e-commerce in India. It's it's quite a must. So how how does this work? Uh, the users have a virtual private address. Um, for example, John at ICIC Bank. Uh, basically, it's the user at and the financial institution. And the good thing is that this uh, virtual private address is unique. And then the user can start uh, funding this VPA through different uh, payment sources. So it's not going to be only linked to their um, bank or to their wallet, but it, it can give them uh, the choice of using any uh, funding source that they would like. How is it uh, to, to pay with, with UPA? 
just uh, using the uh, mobile app for, as we said, the wallet, the bank institution. And uh, it's really simple. The user just need to type their uh, VPA and they will receive whether they are using and their desktop for a, for a purchase or their mobile phone, they will receive a notification within their app on their mobile phone, um, where uh, basically uh, they will confirm the payment and uh, the payment will uh, be on a pending status until the user uh, makes this entire flow. We will see it shortly how everything looks like um, on, the, on the UX side of this. So many of you may heard, have heard of UPI 2.0 uh, that it started in August 2018, where there are different um, add-on features to basic UPI. One is that the customer can link their overdraft account um, through the uh, government system. Another thing is that there is a one-time mandate to uh, allow a scheduled payment. We will see a little bit more on this with Michelle about all the recurring options that we have. Uh, we'll talk about this. And uh, the other thing is that it, what the government wants to do is to give the users the control of their payments and to avoid any fraud, any risks. So basically, giving the users their certainty and the uh, um, being themselves confident with the payments. So to get um, notifications through uh, SMS, through email, or through the apps, uh, to basically confirm their identity and to confirm every payment that is, that is going through. E-wallets, uh, as we said, Pay Paytm is the main digital wallet. Uh, and we have uh, many others such as Google Pay, Phone Pay, M-Pesa. And what we are seeing is that as Paytm consolidated itself as the, the winner so far, we are seeing, as we are seeing the shift towards UPI, we are seeing uh, Google Pay, Phone Pay, and Paytm uh, being the clear leaders, basically Go Pay and Phone Pay. Uh, simply detaching themselves from the from the rest of the herd. Uh, so going forward with UPI, basically making not only ubiquitous payment uh, system, but also uh, getting the users on board um, uh, with uh, this change is making a change on the payments landscape for for e-commerce. Recurring payments. So, um, Anna and Mitch, if you want to uh, talk a little bit here also. Sure. So, this is something, uh, and we are already getting a lot of questions on this. Obviously, a hot topic. Um, yeah. And RBI recently announced uh, that they are opening up uh, different uh, systems and mechanisms for, uh, for recurring payments, uh, starting with cards initially. They, they said both credit cards and debit cards. Uh, then basically they said debit cards won't be possible. And then again, yes, they're possible. So still there's a lot of back and forth over there. Uh, but basically they came out with uh, some regulations to encourage and to regulate uh, specifically recurring payments. The e-mandate basically works as a uh, direct debit. Uh, where users will sign an electronic mandate the first time and then the subsequent times on, on the recurring payments, uh, money can be uh, pulled from their accounts without any further interaction from them. Uh, also, AFA, which is sort of a second factor authenticator, uh, which will only uh, ask users for it during the first transaction. And this is limited to 2,000 rupees. Uh, and the way we, we see it operating today is essentially with uh, recurring payments that happen on a monthly basis. And you can set these recurring payments on a pre-scheduled uh, date for a fixed or variable uh, value. Uh, and, and also notify the user uh, in advance about these charges. What still is uh, not so possible and flexible is for card on file. So think about uh, uh, Netflix, for example, you can 
uh, pay for your subscription uh, on a monthly basis and that's possible but think of uber uh, where still users are, are asked for a uh, one-time password or a second factor authenticator for each ride they take uh, so it's still uh, there's a lot of friction in that process but uh, rbi is working on regulating those as well thanks mitch yes i think uh, there is a huge opportunity in india and we know that the push for uh, having recurring payments and especially card on file now, uh, as you said, is coming um, more and more um, stringent for for the users, and uh, there is a there is a, a growing need in that. So we are working with our partners in India and knowing uh, beforehand from the RBI what are the latest regulation, how uh, banks and financial institutions can. Um, make this change and uh, and be on top of our game in terms of of recurring card of five so let's uh, see what options do we have available for uh, on the user experience space for all these pay methods so cards it's pretty obvious and pretty uh, simple in a sense that it's a standard uh, card number expiration date and, and security code um, we don't need uh, much info there. The the one thing is that all the um, uh, the cards are subject to uh, 3DS right now, uh, so the users get um, the one-time password on their phone associated with the account, and they need to uh, add this uh, one-time password. Uh, what uh, some of the recurring questions that we have is 3DS 2.0. Uh, this is something that we are still waiting for a partner and see how everything evolves uh, in terms of um, changing 3DS and how it works with bio biometrics and other authentication forms. Uh, we are still expecting that, um, but in India, it's not, uh, there is not yet a market uh, for this. And what one of the key things that we see is that, especially for cards, they are usually uh, enabled only for local payments and the user need to uh, go if they want to use them through international processors they need to have a, a, um, a process with their bank to enable these cards so uh, you may see that uh, if you go through an international acquire at first there is a, um, a high rejection rate do in part for this uh, and then the the users are really uh, used to seeing the 3ds flow so they are expecting uh, to see this on their um, on their payment flow uh, so this uh, it's uh, a good thing to have uh, 3ds there UPI uh, UPI uh, we talked briefly about this but basically the main uh, solutions that uh, they work with uh, just the plain UPI address, uh, what we call the VPA. Uh, entering this enables the UPI system to uh, connect to uh, your uh, payment app, whether it's your uh, banking app or wallet. Uh, you see here on the left side, basically the payment is on a pending status waiting for you to complete the purchase so whether you are creating your payment on a desktop or on mobile um, this is waiting for you to complete it and usually you get the user gets an an sms uh, showing that they are requesting to um, to pay for this and once you enter your uh, app you will see all the details of this uh, payment you just need to confirm it and uh, once it, uh, the user confirms the payment, you will see that that pending status will change to an approved status. Net banking is uh, quite similar in, in this sense, meaning that the user is get, gets redirected to the uh, home banking um, website, uh, but it's uh, on a stage before UPI, uh, and so you can see that it may be a little bit outdated and more focused on the desktop side and not uh, that much on, on mobile. But basically, 
choosing um, net banking. Here, instead of just adding easily your UPI address, you need to uh, select your bank. And then once you select uh, your bank, you are redirected to your home banking uh, site. And here it's basically standard process for uh, entering your uh, site. And then you have your payment already created with all the details uh, already there. So you just need to submit it. The thing that you still have is you will have a one-time password sent to your um, phone. Uh, and so the user will get this one-time password. They will um, submit it and the payment will uh, get approved uh, after uh, this. We chose then to show, uh, besides this, the, as a word, the Paytm uh, flow, where it's also pretty uh, standard, where the user right now is redirected to Paytm for the login. They just need to input their uh, phone number and um, password, where it's the phone number or their email. Uh, it's just their uh, user ID uh, for Paytm. They put their password and uh, they can uh, already confirm the payment. Then, as you see, there might be OTPs since uh, there are uh, many regulations for uh, adding a one-time password challenge in all these flows. On the Paytm, you can choose as a user to whether you have it or not. Uh, so this will depend uh, on each user. Great. So after uh, payment methods, we can uh, do a, a quick deep dive on taxes. Uh, thinking about international companies going into India, and we'll focus ourselves on uh, digital goods and services and see what are the relevant tax implications uh, here. Thank you, Rodri. So, and before moving into taxes, just a small comment there uh, on, on a few interesting payment habits that we're seeing. Uh, essentially, for net banking, the average ticket value that we see today is around 6,000 rupees, uh, and that's the, the biggest average ticket value that we see. Then cards with 2,000 rupees, and then UPI with a much smaller uh, ticket of 800 rupees. That's also very, very interesting. Uh, the trend seems to uh, show UPI, UPI growing in terms of volume and value as well. Uh, and now, yes, we can we can go back to taxes. Thank you, Mitch, uh, for this clarification. So taxes, taxes. Uh, there are, have been some interesting changes in the last couple of years uh, in India for digital goods and services, where. Um, other companies, I'll explain this, uh, from overseas are responsible for paying taxes. So if you are selling a digital good or service from outside of India uh, to Indian customers, you will need to pay taxes. You are liable uh, to pay taxes within the country. So OIDAR, uh, it's basically um, an acronym for Online Information Database Access and Retrieval Services. So basically, it's a category uh, for services and products uh, that are in the digital space. Online advertising, cloud uh, providing services, ebooks, movies, music, um, video streaming, data storage, uh, online gaming, other uh, digital services and goods fall into uh, this category. So, for this category, what we have um, from India is that. The GST, the main uh, tax in India, goods and services tax, apply for OIDAR services and goods. So for all digital goods and services that are coming from outside of India, they will need to pay this uh, GST. Within the tax bracket, the most common for all, almost all uh, digital services is 18%. So you'll need to pay 18%. And there are basically two ways of uh, paying the GST. If you are a B2C company, uh, the merchant uh, needs to pay the GST for local and cross-border transactions. 
uh, we'll see how we you can uh, comply with this regulation. And then if it's a B2B company, we have the reverse GST, where the uh, company buying uh, within India uh, is the responsible for paying the GST. Basically, what India is the uh, RBI and the uh, tax authorities in India are doing is to collect the uh, tax from the through the easiest way they they can. So if it's a company, it's already taxated, it's already identified easily within uh, India. So they are asking them to pay for the GST. If it's a B2C company that is selling within India, it's easier to target the company itself rather than to target all uh, the Indian users. So how you can comply with GST being an overseas company? It's quite simple uh, within India. You just need to uh, register through an Indian representative uh, that can be uh, needs to be a local entity. Uh, usually, the the payment service provider that collects uh, your payments can be uh, this this entity. And through a simple uh, registration process, the this company is already uh, the representative uh, within India, and they can collect the taxes uh, on behalf of you so it's really simple and then uh monthly they need to pay um the indian tax authorities all the the gst collected by all the payments uh from indian users so here we have two clarifications we talked about the psp the payment service provider in india there is the figure of OPGSP, the Online Payment Gateway Service Provider, and this um, this framework um, represents a payment service provider that is accepted for uh, accepting payments on behalf of merchants, where it's through uh, local payments to local uh, companies, also for uh, servicing cross-border international transactions. So basically, this OPGSP um, partner that you have in India can help you with the uh, with the taxes, and they basically uh, connect to. Uh, they are allowed to connect to the, all the different available payment methods uh, within India to process your transactions. And then the, what the OPGSP does is not only collect the payments but also get the money out of the country and pay uh, the merchants. This is under the FEMA regulation, the Foreign Exchange Management Act, uh, where it sets the legal framework for uh, administrating the foreign exchange transactions. And basically what it says is that all these transactions need to be addressed by an authorized intermediary, uh, where it's what they call an authorized dealer one, category one, which is a, a bank, um, or an authorized dealer two, which is uh, another financial institution that does foreign exchange transactions. So basically, uh, you need to make sure that your OPGSP is connected through one of these uh, authorized dealers to uh, get the money out of the country. Great. And payouts. Uh, I don't know, Mitch, if you want to set uh, the tone here for payouts, the, the basic example uh that we see in in india and all the other uh, countries where we operate for payouts absolutely so basically it's a it's a very simple flow where uh, merchants will fund our accounts uh could be indian rupees could be us dollars euros gbp or any other currency uh they will send a, a payment request through our api money will flow from our international account to india uh, and then from our Indian account, account we'll pay uh, to the beneficiary uh, and sending back in the API a notification confirming the status of the, of the payment. Thanks, uh, Mitch, for, for this setup. Uh, so thinking about this, what um, we usually see the payouts landscape to pay for the merchants to pay where they are their contractors, their partners, uh, for the ride sharing applications, uh, drivers for um, home sharing uh, website, also for the, the renters of those apartments, 
uh, recipients of refunds, marketplace sellers. So all these um, players that usually uh, take part in the gig economy uh, since a few years ago are a really a good target for uh, this payout system. And what we see in um, in India is basically we have uh, two models. One is the OPGSP model that is the same um, regulation that we saw um, just for for payments for for payments from Indian users. And then the other one is the RDA uh, model, which, which is a rupee drawing arrangement uh, that gives uh, some flexibilities uh, in terms of uh, limits, in terms of uh, taxes that we will see just now. And then for the, the um, payouts themselves, what we uh, have is we have uh, bank transfers, and these bank transfers come through uh, can come through two main uh, methods. One it's NEFT and the other one is IMPS that we will see um, right now. And just for the people in the audience to give an idea of these two different models, uh, NEFT is comparable to ACH, whereas IMPS is similar to wire transfers. Correct. So in NEFT, uh, what we have is that it's uh, every four hours the, the payments and the transfers are, are made. Uh, and then it is during a uh, business hour during banking hours then when the banks close everything is rescheduled for uh starting the next uh business day the other site imps immediate payment service it's from one side is more expensive than neft but on the other side it's a real time transfer basically upi system is based on imps so you can see uh the reliability and the uh how immediate it is and we talked a bit about RDA. Um, the industries that are allowed within RDA are basically focused on education and uh, tourism and uh, wallets. So basically educational payments, um, different uh, educational sites that need to pay their partners, hotels, lodging and travel agencies, uh, tour guides or similar are, uh, we, fall within this RDA model. And the good thing about uh, RDA is that currently for payouts, there are no uh, taxes. So basically, this, uh, these industries are um, regulated in a way that the, um, uh, the RBI and the government, they are um, giving these benefits uh, through the RDA model. And then for all the other industries, uh, they fall into OPGSP, where we have also the good and services tax. And uh, you see here the tax uh, brackets where it started with 0.18%. Uh, and um, it can go up to uh, almost 11,000 rupees uh, for the uh, payments um, above 1 million uh, rupees. And basically, it, uh, you have the option of paying on behalf of your end customer or adding this to your end customer. Uh, this doesn't change uh, the, the way that the, the tax is, is retained. Uh, so, so yeah, it gives you a flexibility on taxes and on how to successfully process payouts within India. And with that, I think we can take some uh, questions from uh, our attendees. Thank you, Rodri. We do have a few questions from the audience. Awesome. Let's start with the first one. What's the difference between net banking and UPI? So we uh, we talked a little bit about this, but basically, net banking. If you think about net banking, you think about uh, making a bank transfer from your bank account to uh, the merchant. And UPI, you've seen that it's a different solution that is uh, focused more on not only um, transfer, but also payments and um, gives the flexibility to the user of using their uh, app of choice, where it's their bank app or their wallet or any new financial institute that may come in the next uh, months or years to make payments to any other uh, UPI account. So you don't need to do a 
bank to bank uh, payment. You can do a, a wallet to bank or card to e wallet or any uh, funding source to any other um, source from the from the receiver side. So it gives you uh, the flexibility and gives the flexibility to users to choose any uh, the most convenient uh, funding source for paying. Thank you. Moving to the next question. Uh, is UPI an app from the government? So it's not an app for the So it, uh, it's regulated and it uh, brought uh, the IMPS, the Immediate Payment Services uh, Framework, to use uh, UPI. And uh, this will um, go through the channel of regulating and going in pair with the uh, demonetization that we are seeing in it. So it's highly uh, recommended by the Indian government and they made a lot of push to have uh, this way of payment uh, live and to get traction. Um, but it's not entirely from the uh, UPI, um, from sorry, from the government itself. Thank you. Uh, continuing with UPI. In UPI, is the user redirected to their home banking? Uh, what if they are buying through desktop? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. In UPI, is the user redirected to their home banking? What if they are buying through desktop? Perfect. So you see that uh, UPI, it works uh, entirely on their phone. And so it's a uh, mobile service based. And so if the user is paying through the desktop, they will still receive uh, the, the payment uh, details and will be expecting the payment conference through their phone. What would happen is that on the desktop, uh, the payment will be on a pending status waiting for that confirmation to happen. Once the user confirms the payment on their phone, uh, basically what will happen is that their uh, UPI app will uh, confirm the payment towards the your payments processor and then your payments processor will uh, confirm this payment back to you as a merchant so uh, the payment will be uh, finalized in the desktop everything through the through the back end awesome thank you next question is uh, which payment model would you recommend most for b2b payouts from india great so uh, for B2B, one thing that um, that we discussed was uh, RDA versus OPGSP. So if you have a um, um, model based on education or um, tourism, we highly uh, recommend to go through RDA. Uh, this is something that uh, it is um, subsidized by the government in a way. There are no taxes. It's easier uh, on the um, KYC side. So uh, basically, it gives you uh, a lot of benefits to go through this model for, for payment. So for education, for uh, hotels, uh, lodging agencies, tour guides, uh, travel agencies that are doing both, uh, getting getting users to from India to uh, the world and the other way around. Basically, companies that are um, offering services within India for international uh, customers. Perfect. Uh, one more question uh, related. Would hotel commissions from Indian hotels to non-Indian agencies qualify for RDA? Yes, uh, they do. Okay, perfect. Um, I think we covered this, but it's probably worth repeating. Uh, when are recurring payments with cards going to be available in India? So uh, card on file, it's uh, the big uh, question mark that uh, that we have still. Uh, subscription payments, it's already available for credit cards. Uh, so if you want to have a uh, subscription model you can start uh, using um, credit cards and debit cards debit cards they are still uh, starting so um, we had a mandates from about four weeks ago from the RBI uh, the basic central bank of India 
giving the authorization to do um, recurring payments for debit cards uh, with one time only um, uh, multi-factor authentication. So basically uh, approving the payment on the first time through uh, an e-mandate and then um, making the recurring payments automatic. The thing is that uh, they had started in the past, so a few banks started giving this option to their debit cards, then the, the RBI tracked back. So we have only a few uh, percentage of debit cards. And now, um, as I said a few weeks ago, the RBI gave the new mandate where it uh, gave the option of doing this for all debit cards and for uh, payments under 2,000 uh, rupees. So uh, in that sense, we will see everything coming along and and seeing that the, the market share for recurring payments in debit cards, we are expecting to, to grow. Uh, we are working closely with our um, partners um, in India to really understand uh, how everything evolves and, and what are the right uh, measures on on time and how we will uh, connect to this uh, this solution. Thank you, Rodri. We are already running out of time. We'll take uh, two or three more questions. Um, what can you say about 3ds in India? <laughs> uh, what can I say? Um, Other than it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so it's still stuck with the, all the. Uh, 3ds 1.0 so for desktop it works well for uh, phone it works uh, less well <laughs> I would say um, but but it's it's th the good thing is that the um, Indian consumer is expecting the 3ds so they are already uh, waiting for this to happen so in terms of uh, user behavior it's a good thing to have it uh, we will see how everything uh, evolves, especially with um, UPI and this trend going digital uh, harder and harder in, in India, how everything will evolve, if they will go through 3DS 2.0 or if the market share will shift from cards towards uh, UPI uh, and wallets. And so basically the, the, the multi-factor authentication will change from a 3DS um, coming from the main uh, card brands Visa, Mastercard, Amex towards uh, more uh, innovative solutions from uh, Indian players and, and digital players themselves. All right. And last question, uh, a very popular question actually, we got it uh, three times. Is uh, Paytm available for recurring payments? Yes. So. Uh, the functionality is there. We as a company, we are rolling this out in uh, Q4, so uh, just in a, in a few weeks. And basically it gives um, the solution of getting the token, tokenizing the user ID for uh, Paytm and making those recurring payments through uh, this, uh, this option. Uh, so uh, we are seeing, so we were, uh, testing it, we are seeing some traction, so the idea is to start uh, testing it live um, in Q4 uh, and be ready to launch it uh, across all our uh, merchants. Perfect. And that's a wrap. We don't have more time. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, stay tuned for more webinars to come. Have a great day. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.